I think my earliest memory of motorsport would have been, would have been the Group B era in, um, in rallying, in 84 to 86 would have been the era. And I just remember the sound of, of an Audi Quattro on full chat was, was just, it, that's what got me involved in, in rallying in particular. Um, and I remember once my dad bought a 1985 Audi 90, the same five cylinder engine as, as the Quattro's had. And the sound of that car just, just really, really hit off. And um, that just, yeah, I thought, yeah, that's my dad's car. Well, I left school at 17 and I went straight away into my dad's flooring company. And um, I you know, were fitting carpets for a good part of 17 years. Physically, I don't think I could have managed another 15 or 16 years of, of fitting flooring because it takes a toll on your body. I've done numerous jobs alongside the flooring company. I was a postman and uh, a soccer coach in America, um, and I started being a sports shop. But, you know, all those pale in comparison compared to what I'm doing now. So um, I quit my job. And then the next week, I bought a Lancia Fulvia from Austria, Group 4 rally car, uh, 1972, lovely little car, Marlboro Works livery, looked great. Um, put it on eBay, and within Two or three days, I had an email from a chap in Austria. It went well. The guy made an offer, sold the car. Uh, oh, can I look at the paperwork? Yeah, yeah, here it is. Oh, this guy who bought the car from lives five minutes down the road from me. I was like, oh, oh does he? Oh, okay. Um, okay, he bought the car, took it back, and uh, yeah, I'm sure they're good friends. My main ethos of the business is to buy cars that I like because I want to sell to people that have the same passion as me. But when you do that, the market becomes narrower and narrower and smaller and smaller. So um, there's quite a bit of pressure. I mean, you can have a couple of cars sat around for you know, a couple of months and you think, where, you know, are these cars going to sell? And it can be nerve wracking when it does go quiet because it, you know, in the three years I've been doing it, it's gone quite a few times. But if you stick to your guns and have, have faith, it generally pays off. Well, the Fiat X19. It originally as a production car, it had a 1300 engine or a 1500 engine um, and Fiat needed a car to take over the rally days of, of the Fiat 124 and um, they looked at the X19 and thought this is a good basis for a rally car. So they took the X19, they put the engine of the 124 bath in there, in the back and um, you know, as, a, as a competition car, it was a prototype and it had many tests, famous rally drivers like Clay Regazzoni and Bernard Doniche both rallied them in the Tour de Course and famous rallies and it did pretty well but Fiat looked at it and thought well you know I think we could probably as a, as a marketing strategy sell more Fiat 131s than we could Fiat X19s so then the X19 was effectively binned as a project and left in the doldrums and you know I think that's why it's got quite a bit of an appeal. I probably put a figure of around about six I'd say was, was the, the, the production total so they're very, very rare cars. They're pretty much priceless now. So having a replica of the car is, um, you know, a dream really. The Fiat X19 that we built is, you know, it looks great and you know it's very striking in appearance. But it's, it's not just about the looks. It is a genuine MSA logbook rally car. You know, it's got a two-liter twin cam in there, 175 horsepower. It's got coilover suspension, uh, big brake conversion, uh, close ratio gearbox. So all the all the essentials are there for for a, a real rally car. Um, I bought the car two years ago. It had the essentials, like I said, all the bits were there for a rally car, but it just looked a little bit, a little bit sorry for itself. So I, you know, I bought the kit in, the Abarth kit, you know, worked my magic and, and made a few phone calls here and there and had a lot of help from some good friends and some good people. And uh, yeah, we managed to finish the build and um, yeah, it's ready, ready to go. To drive the car, it, it's quite intense, you know, it's quite a compact cabin and the steering wheel's in your face and the gear gear sticks up here and you know it's it's quite an quite an event what you've got is a rear perspex screen is what you've got between you and the engine um, so yeah you hear every mechanical nuance it's, you hear the gear change you hear you know you hear the revs climbing you hear the exhaust popping and flame stick coming out of the back and carburetors popping back so yeah it's an experience driving these cars I must admit um, handles on a six months you can you can turn it you know in, in a circle you can handbrake it and it goes you know, round and round and round Power to rate ratio weighs about 940 kilos, 175 horsepower, so you're looking at about 200 horsepower per ton. So it's it's pretty pretty up there with um, 
with the Group 4 Mark II Escort, I think. I think the Fulvia has a recurring theme with me. I, you know, ever since I've driven my first one with the, with the Marlboro Library one, I think since driving that, you know, any other car pales in comparison, really. Um, the way they handle their front engine, the front wheel drive, only about 90 horsepower if you're lucky. With a standard car, you can get 130 horsepower out of a Group 4 rally car. But the way they handle their pin sharp handling, I've never driven a front wheel drive car that handles as well as, as well as a Fulvia. They were way ahead of the time. They had twin, twin choke carburetors, four branch manifold, disc brakes all around. So you look at the cars of the period, no car no car could repair with the, the engineer in the Fulvia. And I think when Fiat took them over, they looked at the Fulvia statistics and said, well, this, this car is costing a lot to make. You know, it's costing a fortune. So I, I, they made some cutbacks. And I think the later Fulvias were not as well made and desirable as the early ones. The engine of a Fulvia is, is, is the heart and soul of them, really. I mean, they're, they're a very strange concoction. They're a, a V4 engine, but it's such a narrow, narrow angle of the, of the cylinders. They're, they're 12, 12 or 13 degrees, so it's a very narrow bank, and um, it's one cylinder head. So it's very rare for a V engine to have one cylinder head. I think the way they, they were engineered, the narrow bank of the, you know, the V engine and five-speed or four-speed gearboxes, I think they're way ahead of their time. And I'm quite lucky in a way that I work from home most of the time. I mean, I'm here in, in the unit in, in the lockup working on the cars, but 50% of the time I'm at home you know, researching and emailing and, and networking. And I get to see my little daughter, Elsie Willow, on quite a regular basis. And I get to see all the good bits, all these little special moments you get becoming a father. So, I mean, a lot of people wouldn't, wouldn't get to do this. Um, if I worked, I, my old job was eight till, eight till six. She'd be asleep when I got up and she'd be in bed when I got home. So I, I want to do my own thing. And I think doing what I'm doing now is, um, yeah, it's, it's certainly, certainly nice. If, you know, if she wants to go in, into the car world and the classic car world and yeah, so be it. I can always remember my dad coming in from work and the smell of wool carpets on his clothing. It, it was, that smell brings back fond memories when I was a child. You know, oh, dad's home and give him a cuddle and you smell that wool carpets. And, um, you know, I think, I like to think the smell of oil and grease and petrol and fumes. When I come home from work and give my children, you know, a big hug, I, I like to think maybe they might smell, you know, in the petrol station and smell the fumes. Oh, I remember dad coming in for work and you know, smelling like that. The future for Targa Florida Classic, if it keeps going the way it's going, um, you know, I'm never going to be a millionaire doing this. It's, you know, it's my passion and what I want to do. But I'd like, I'd like to have a, a, a nice glitzy, glitzy showroom to show these cars off. I think they need to be on display and people need to see them. I'd also like to have a, you know, a dedicated team Targa Florio Classics team of mechanics and fabricators and I do get a sense of you know, you know satisfaction and some pride in what I've achieved in, in the relatively short time I've been going two or three years um, so yeah it, it is a gratifying you know place to be in, in the situation to be in and I mean you know sometimes I finish here when I'm done around sort of you know, five or six ish and I just sit in the car sometimes and, you know, just take in the smells and look around and, you know, fire up a car. And the sounds and the smells just, you know, to me, that's, that's heaven. That's, that's what it's all about. That's, that's it. <laughs>